hi everyone, welcome to Net Seminar. Um, today's talk is going to be from Via Sekar. Uh, Via did his PhD at CMU and then he went to Stony Brook University. And a few months ago he went back home to CMU and now he's a professor there. Uh, his work has been on uh, video, uh, internet video, middle boxes, and security. And today's talk is going to be about mm -hmm. SDN and middle boxes and a few ideas that they work on how we can integrate them through backwards compatibility and some new abstractions on ADN for new boxes. Uh, before we start, just a note, we're going to have an Ed seminar next week as well uh, with Edward Ferton from Princeton, and I'll send more details uh, in the next few days. So, thank you, sir. Uh, thanks, Janis, for the introduction, and, and thanks for hosting me. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, so this is a talk uh, that's really, I mean, th this talk is based on work that's really driven by two of my students. Uh, Sayed, who is now a student at CMU and, and software. So really all the hard work was done by them. Uh, I'm just a messenger over here. And this has also been done in collaboration with uh, Jeff Mogul at Google and Vinla New at uh, USC. So really what sort of prompted or motivated uh, this line of work that we've been doing in middle boxes is really this, some, is this, this fundamental disconnect between uh, what we sort of teach in Networks 101 uh, and what's sort of the reality out there in the, in the real world. So what we teach in Networks 101 is the network is a dumb network. It's just pushing bits around, it's just basic plumbing. Uh, but then you say, okay, well, people want security, people want performance, people want like all sorts of policy compliance requirements. Uh, so how does it actually happen inside the network? And the reality is that there's actually a lot of complex in-network processing that's going on. There's a lot of stateful uh, middle boxes and network appliances. Uh, things like intrusion detection systems, uh, firewalls, proxies, application gateways, and sort of the whole gamut of uh, sort of complicated processing that's happening inside the network. So to understand sort of what's the reality, uh, we started by looking at uh, sort of doing surveys of uh, operational networks. And sort of the, the, the graph here uh, is a survey from uh, 57 network operators in Nanog, and the table here is data from like one uh, large enterprise network that we surveyed. So sort of the staggering statistic is sort of at the bottom of the table there is that the number of middle boxes, like the uh, firewalls, NITs, and so on, is almost on par uh, with the number of traditional uh, routers and switches in this, in this uh, enterprise network. So in some sense, these seem to be a critical <laughs> part of the infrastructure, sort of paralleling traditional networking equipment. But as sort of as a community, we seem to have ignored them uh, for a while. So in fact, if you look at market surveys, uh, the market for just network security appliances uh, is, is close to tens of billions of dollars. And, and of course, this is not just an artifact of this one large enterprise we looked at. Uh, we did a much, in this much broader survey, we found that across different market segments, large enterprises, small enterprises, uh, ISP networks, that we see a consistent trend uh, where the number of middle boxes, uh, sort of all these diverse boxes, is comparable to the number of traditional switches and routers. So this is a consistent trend that we see across uh, many different network settings. Now clearly, people perceive a lot of value in these middle boxes. So they, uh, the operators get uh, critical security performance and policy compliance requirements that they have to meet through these boxes. Uh, but at the same time, uh, managing these networks is actually a lot of pain. That at the same surveys, we, we talk to people and, and we ask these questions, we found that uh, they actually spend a lot of effort in managing the network with a lot of these middle boxes. So in fact, uh, the large enterprise I, I surveyed, uh, they told us that they actually have dedicated teams for each kind of appliance. So they have a van team, they have a load balancing team, uh, they have a firewall team, uh, they have an IDS team, and so on. Uh, and managing these middle boxes causes a lot of problems. For example, a uh, lot of times, uh, these service chaining policies tend to be misconfigured because they have to set up uh, sort of crazy static routes inside the network. Uh, a lot of failures are caused by uh, middle box overload because these middle boxes are not just simple switches. They're actually doing a fairly deep packet inspection. They're doing like sophisticated stateful processing. So overload causes a lot of failures. And this has been seen uh, also in sort of Microsoft's uh, data centers where they find that uh, these middle boxes are often the critical path uh, in, a, in a lot of failure scenarios. And the people do spend a lot of money uh, in employing personnel to manage these middle boxes. The bottom of the chart, reasons why each of these middle boxes fail. So it's just sort of across the surveys, we said, yeah, what, what percentage of time, what percentage of problems, what percentage of time do you spend in dealing with these kind of problems? 
So like 63 percent of the time they spend oh, like, okay, time, yeah, okay. time of like operators, uh, like, uh, sorry, effort in, in doing. So really, sort of the motivating question for us came from sort of this. Okay, these middle boxes are here to stay. Right? There, there are a lot of uh, value that people perceive in them. So what can we do, sort of as the academic community and say as the SDM community, to help simplify uh, middle box management? Right. So we take the canonical view of SDM. Uh, so you have a central, logically centralized controller, you have the administrator giving some high-level policy, and these are compiled down uh, into flow table rules, uh, say using something like OpenFlow. Right? So this is sort of the canonical view of SDN. And what we're really asking is imagine an administrator comes up with these more complex service chaining policies, saying, oh, web traffic needs to go through a firewall, an IDS, and a proxy in that particular order, uh, in that particular <coughs> policy sequence. Can SDN help the administrator to simplify the management of all these complex policies? Right? And that's really where uh, we are coming from. And in some sense, we are not, we are not, we are not sort of we are not alone uh, in, in recognizing uh, this challenge or an, an, and an opportunity for SDN. Uh, so there's a market survey that was done uh, sometime I think in 2012 uh, of like uh, vendors and, and CIOs, and people did sort of really feel that a lot of the value they perceived in SDN. Uh, was much higher level than, say, a traditional routing and forwarding. Really, the value they saw was in these sort of more uh, advanced functions, like the services that the market views as important, and somehow they felt that this was a sort of a critical uh, need that SDN could have fulfilled for them. So really, what we think here is sort of, uh, it's both a necessity as well as an opportunity for SDN, right? It's a necessity in the sense that here is a critical piece of the networking market uh, that's not quite in the SDN fold yet. And it's an opportunity because now we can actually demonstrate from, S, from an SDN point of view, here's the like tangible value that SDN can, can provide uh, network operators in these different market segments. So that's really where we are coming from uh, in the sort of the SDN side of things. So at a high level, what makes this problem hard or interesting or challenging is that these boxes, like say a proxy or an IDS, uh, introduce sort of new dimensions to SDN that are not quite traditional routing and forwarding, right? So our, our current focus mostly in SDN has been like access control, routing, forwarding, like sort of very canonical network functions. But these boxes are introducing new dimensions that go beyond uh, those traditional functions. So for example, I mentioned uh, you have this requirement of like policy-based steering. So like uh, if you talk to the application world, they call it like service chaining, uh, sort of we, we call it like steering uh, or, or policy composition. The other dimension they introduced is that you actually now need new resource management me mechanisms. So how do you deal with uh, middle box failures, how do you deal with middle box overload, and so on. So you, sort of there's a new uh, sort of objective requirements or goals uh, that it introduces to SDM. And finally, uh, these boxes are proprietary and they do a lot of like sophisticated logic insight. Uh, and they do introduce like hidden actions and hidden transformations on packet headers that are not quite exposed to uh, SDM mechanisms. So that, that creates a challenge in integrating these boxes uh, inside the current SDN code. So that's really what sort of in a nutshell what makes this problem hard is that you have these new dimensions beyond <coughs> traditional routing and forwarding tasks. Can you get Yeah. Are you including in this last one the tunnel? Uh, so meaning new dimensions? Are you talking about like mechanism? Tunneling is a potential mechanism to <coughs> solve some of these problems. Well, it's also a mechanism that can cause Problems. Certainly, certainly. Tunneling definitely causes some of these problems. So, uh, uh, in fact, a lot of the ways people deal with these middle boxes today is to create a lot of complex tunnelings, and that, cre that does create a lot of problems. Uh, but at this sort of high level, I'm not assuming tunneling is creating a problem. I'm looking at a much more uh, kind of first principles approach. Just think about adding these boxes to the network. How does it create problems? Another question. Well, I was just asking for an example of those. Uh, we will get to that in a bit. Just for So, so what we've really been doing is actually, I think we're just scratching the surface here. So this is really a very preliminary work that we've been doing. So one is sort of work that we did called the simple system. And it's really looking at a backwards compatible way of integrating uh, these middle boxes and these service chaining policies using existing SDN mechanisms, like using, say, OpenFlow uh, 1.1, and using, as, uh, using sort of legacy unmodified middle boxes. So it's like saying, OK, what can we do for the world today? And going forward, we actually sort of in this process that we said, okay, let's let's try to push the limits of the of the current world. We did sort of hit some bottlenecks, and these were like fundamental bottlenecks that we couldn't quite solve uh, with a purely backwards compatible approach. 
And that's where we came up with this sort of new extension to SDN called flow tags, which is really talking about how we handle uh, some of these sort of more proprietary hidden actions of, of middle boxes that might allow for a more clean way to integrate them uh, inside the SDN code. So that's where this, this talk is really about uh, these two pieces of work that we have done. Uh, one, a legacy sort of backwards compatible mechanism, and the other sort of more future looking, say, uh, you're thinking of NFV, you're thinking of service chaining, what's a clean way to integrate uh, these advanced packet processing functions inside the SDN code? Okay, so in the rest of this talk, I'm going to first start, start by talk, motivating the design of the simple system, uh, which is the traffic steering solution, then go into flow tags uh, before I sort of uh, summarize. Okay, so at a very, very high level, what simple is, is, as I mentioned, it's a policy enforcement layer. So imagine you have these service chaining policies <coughs> that an administrator comes up with, uh, of say that traffic needs to go through firewall IDS and proxy. What simple lets the administrator do is specify this, uh, this chaining policy at a very high level, and then it compiles down into flow, flow rules uh, at the, at the uh, data plane level. So it's sort of this in-between in layer uh, sitting at the network controller that translates these high-level policies into, actual, into an actual physical realization. And the key here is that we're actually going to do it with legacy <coughs> middle boxes. You can bring any middle box you want. And we're going to use existing open flow mechanisms. So no extensions uh, whatsoever. <coughs> so what were the challenges? Right? Let me elaborate on what, was, what, what made this uh, interesting or what made this challenging. The first challenge is that uh, we're actually looking at something beyond just forwarding. We're actually trying to look at like some sort of an overlay co policy composition routing. Uh, so for example, in, the, in this simple topology, uh, you have two switches, S1 and S2, and you have like three middle boxes. And what the administrator wants to do is uh, chain, sort of chain uh, these middle boxes such that a packet goes through a firewall, an IDS, and a proxy in that particular sequence. So we have this sort of sequential composition logic that we want to impose in the network. So what could go wrong, right? I mean, it seems simple, I should be able to do that. <coughs> the problem is that as a packet goes through the network, we actually kind of see that the same packet arrives at the switch S2 uh, multiple times. So it's coming on the same interface with the same headers, and then we don't quite know what to do with this packet, right? So switch to S2, just by looking at the headers, it can't quite decide if it needs to send this to the destination or if it needs to send to the proxy, uh, send to the uh, IDS in this case. Just by looking at the headers, because you only have flow level rules, we can't quite implement this, uh, this sort of composition logic uh, using ex existing open flow rules. In fact, there is a logical loop in this network because the same packet is traversing the same link multiple times, and simple flow level rules that you would use sort of naively would not quite work, in, even in this very sort of toy, uh, toy example. So that's one sort of challenge that we came across in trying to use uh, existing open flow rules, and we said, okay, here's a simple example where we can uh, we can show that simple flow rules may not suffice. So the solution to this problem is actually not that not sort of uh, not that hard. The real insight here is that we need some mechanism uh, to distinguish different instances of a packet. So conceptually, this packet that came uh, at this switch S2, there are different incarnations of this packet, and we need to be able to conceptually distinguish uh, these two different incarnations of this packet. So when we generate rules in the forwarding in the data plane, we need to make sure that we can distinguish these different incarnations. So conceptually, what we need is imagine that we have a logical tag that lets you identify what is the processing state of this packet. So when the packet comes in, it's a sort of this unmodified sort of a native state. Then as it goes through the network, we kind of tag it and say, okay, it's gone through the firewall, it's gone through the ideas, and it's gone through the proxy. Now, once you have these tags, these additional logical tags, the switch S2 can now actually distinguish these different incarnations and use the processing context or the processing state to decide what the forwarding action should be. Right? So in this case, because I know it's post-proxy, I know I should forward it to the, to the destination. But if it was, like, was post-firewall, I would actually send it back to the IDS. So you're kind of breaking the loop by uh, adding state inside the packet header itself. And the nice thing is actually we can implement this mechanism very simply using existing open flow schemes. Right? You can use existing headers, the switches can just add a few more bits, and the controller can inform these actions to add these tags such that it tracks the uh, processing state of the packet. So this is about sort of how do you do composition in practice uh, in this network. Uh, are you yeah. thinking of these labels on a per flow basis? Or is the policy 
Uh, in this case, you can think about it as per flow or per packet. It doesn't really quite make it a flow. Um, but then you will have explosion of time. Sorry? And you will have too many rules to handle at these uh, Not really. Actually, you can do a lot of these things pretty proactively. So you can actually, because the controller knows the topology and it knows what service chain, what physical chain it's using, you can sort of pre-compute and say, okay, this, this, this particular tag is a post proxy for this particular chain. And actually, you can pre-compute. It doesn't need that many tags. In some sense, the, the number of tags you need is really the the length of the processing chain. It's not much more than that. So, why is that, that policy chain or the tags are basically state or state of the packet? It's state of the it's a, it's a, sort of the processing state of the packet that that's being exposed to the network. So, co conceptually, what we need is really the length of the chain, and we can sort of show its length. Of the chain. Okay. So, this is about how do we do composition in practice? It's actually a much more a more a subtle problem. The subtle problem I mentioned was that we actually have new resource management uh, requirements when you ha handle these middle boxes. So in particular, one, one, one problem we saw that a common cause for these boxes to fail was that they could not handle the, uh, the load that was sent to them. So they might be overloaded. So a natural thing you want to do is actually balance the load across these different middle box instances. So in this network, we have two IDS instances, IDS1 and IDS2. And what we want to do uh, is actually split the load between these two boxes such that each one gets like half the traffic. And again, here sort of SDN is nice, OpenFlow is nice, because it lets you do like an in-network load balancing solution. Uh, otherwise, what people would do is like every box would sort of come up with a, come with a sort of a daughter load balancer box that would essentially do the load balancing for them. So SDN is nice because it lets you do in-network load balancing. <coughs> the challenge though <coughs> is that when you have a lot of these policies and a lot of these load balancing requirements, you actually start hitting limits in terms of the uh, the number of rules that you can install in the available uh, TCAM with the switches. So uh, even though sort of this new switch is coming up with more TCAM space, uh, we are roughly talking about like few thousands of rules. But if you have a large network uh, with many of these policies and many end-to-end uh, -end, uh, pairs, you would easily run into like problems where you don't have enough uh, TCAM space to install all of these rules. So the, sort of the challenge here is that. Can we actually do this load balancing uh, in a near optimal fashion, but at the same time not violate the uh, resource constraints of the switches? So in some sense, you have this sort of joint problem where you have to deal with switch constraints as well as your uh, middle box uh, constraints. Yes? So by optimality, you mean minimizing the number of forwarding loads? Uh, so here, optimality kind of is, is with respect to the load balancing on the boxes. So in this case, so uh, the optimal solution is to do 50-50 in terms of the load balancing of the, of the middle boxes. So that's really an objective function. And the, the, switch is, the switch rules are kind of the constraint saying, oh, I have only 4,000 rules. Do optimal load balancing given you only have 4,000 rules. Uh, you, you could formulate the other way around as well, but we are looking, we are looking at this problem. Are you assuming that uh, <coughs> the appliances, the uh, IDS or firewall mm -hmm. proxy, can handle the special, special tag header? Because of the third party, a person cannot cannot look at the special header, like a tag. And oh, so you're asking about the previous case? Yeah. You're talking about this example? Yeah, yeah. Pre -pre -pre previous case. Yeah. Actually, no, the, the tags don't have anything, no semantic for the middle boxes. The tag semantics is purely for uh, the switches and the data plane. So in fact, the switch can actually remove the tag before it sends it to the proxy. So the, 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 this, this solution is completely oblivious to what the middle boxes are doing. The middle boxes may not even see the tag. <laughs> No. But in the, in the second half of the talk, the talk, we'll actually get to a state where the middle boxes need to understand tag semantics. But mm -hmm. hold on for that. No, okay. In this particular case, we just want to do forwarding. Uh, the tag semantics are completely oblivious to the middle boxes. Okay. So, so, so the question is, we have this sort of multiple uh, objectives and constraints. We need to, when you do these middle boxes and want to do load balancing, uh, how do you do it in a near optimal fashion? And really, what you need to do, ideally, is this is some sort of a joint optimization problem. You say, oh, I have switch constraints, I have middle box constraints, I have some policy requirements, oh, I know what my topology and traffic patterns look like, and I want to be able to have the controller set up the data plane rules in such a way that it does not violate the switch TCAM constraints. But at the same time, it optimally, optimally balances the load across the middle box instances. So that's kind of the formulation of the problem. It turns out this is actually theoretically hard, and, and really, uh, and many people uh, have sort of seen this in multiple instances. When you start talking about these TCAM constraints, 
they're actually these sort of integer discrete constraints. So the minute you have this integer or discrete constraints in an optimization problem, it very, very quickly becomes an NP-hard problem because it becomes like a, you have to do like this integer discrete modeling and that makes a lot of these problems uh, NP-hard. And in fact, in our case, it's actually even harder uh, it's sort of conceptually because we can't even figure out if I give you a particular configuration saying do 50-50 uh, load balancing, I don't even know if that configuration is feasible or not. So I, I, I can't even tell you, oh, maybe there is an option. I, don't even, I can't even tell you that. So our solution to this problem, sort of uh, this resource management problem, is really sort of this uh, simple but effective insight. The insight here is that uh, you can actually decompose what looks like a very hard, theoretically hard problem into an offline stage and an online stage. And what we can do is in the offline stage, uh, we actually deal with the hard part. So you have these hard switch constraints that are like a hard limit on the number of rules a switch can handle. You can actually do a lot of this, the, the hard optimization, uh, making sure you have a feasible set of rules and we can make sure we solve it in the offline stage. So you can sort of pre-compute, uh, given these patterns, given this topology, uh, what are the feasible paths or the feasible rules you can set up. And really load balancing in the online stage, that is, if the traffic changes, how do I do the load balancing, that's actually a much simpler problem. That's just a, a simple linear program optimization and that can be done really fast. So the, sort of the insight here is that uh, we can decouple this problem into an offline and an online part. We can deal with switch constraints in the offline part, and we deal with the resource management of middle boxes in the online part. So sort of we, we exploiting the structure of the problem uh, to have a practical solution. Okay. So this sort of clear? Yeah. Yeah. So in <coughs> some of the policy training examples you have looked at, could you give us a sense of I mean, how how quickly does this thing actually blow up? Like, how many switch decambles do you really need to uh, to service chain the simple example, the IDS firewall? And things like that? So yeah, so good question. Right? Is, is this is this uh, do we actually hit these uh, rule limits in practice? So just to give you a back of the envelope calculation, imagine you have a network with like hundred egresses and uh, ingresses, like mm -hmm. like hundred exit nodes, mm -hmm. uh, and then you have like uh, now you have like hundred squared ingress egress pairs. Now imagine you have, like, say, four different policy classes for each ingress egress pair. Like saying, okay, traffic from me to you has to go through um, on port 80 has to go through policy one. Traffic on port 22 goes through policy two. Now you have like four n squared already, right? So if you have like four times 10,000, some core router in this network might actually have to have rules for all possible pairs. If you sort of just did like flow, even even doing wildcard rules, it would need like four times n squared rules, and that quickly bloats up beyond. But there's a hierarchy built in. Right. You're, you're talking about n squared between services as opposed to uh, ingress egress uh, pairs that you're actually interested in. So you could maybe have the network just handle at the service level, and then do the flow level, and maybe even sub flow level at the, at the edges. No, no, certainly you could oh, do yeah. some of those things. Yeah, but like that's, that's exactly what like Nicer and all that most of the NFT people propose, right? Certainly. So there's some of the things that in, in the fabric case you're saying. Yes, you're okay. you have a fabric at the center and do all the so sure, tons hierarchy. of rules on the edge. And, Possible. I mean, that's something you could do. Something that you could do, but that's, that that actually we don't know. If, for example, if that's actually feasible to do, you may actually have middle boxes already in your network. So if you're doing a, a, a clean slate design where you have like a data center, you can do whatever you want. Maybe that's an option. But if you actually want to deal with the legacy boxes that are already out there and you want to load balance across your existing infrastructure, that may not necessarily be an option. But yeah, but certainly the, the, the edge decomposition yeah, yeah, is another thing you could use. Because most most load balancers are essentially PCs, which you can run like OpenVSwitch or something. So the edge, you know, it doesn't have to be physically the edge. It can be still within your network. <laughs> I mean, it's it's it's, it's not. These are not conflicting. I think these are kind of complementary. Yeah. So also the hardware switch decam resource constraint is a very open flow 1.0 view of the world, uh -huh. right? There are many more tables in a switch, right? Sure. Which uh, the later versions of open flow have. Subsequently exposed through an abstraction. So, exactly. so that resource constraint may be just a. Uh, may, may not be real, right? I mean, Possible. Or, I agree. So I mean, I, no, I mean, I, I don't deny that. I mean, you can have like sort of these uh, more interesting match tables, and you can have like sort of these sequence of tables, and there are more optimal solutions for even building all these TCAMs as well. Okay. Uh, but the deal is. I, I could always come. I could it's always just a view that a lot of people have, and no, no, may, not be, may not be real because it's just an old view of uh, you know the. It's possible. I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm not a hardware person, yeah. so so 
I mean, in, in some sense, to me, it's like when we are modeling it, we say, okay, if it has, like, say, a million rules, this this problem becomes easy for me, right? And I'm happy if this problem becomes easy for me. But you can always come up with an example where there are many more fine-grained policies. So imagine, for example, you are doing a cellular network and you want to do a policy for each customer or each class of customers. I could always come up with more and more complex policies that will hit the rule bottleneck. Unless you say this is infinity, right? I mean, so it, it's nice to have a systematic solution that will always work. And then you say, okay, well, if you have more, it just means that this particular framework has more degrees of freedom to do the load balance. So if you think of it this way, it's like, here's, I'm, I'm giving you a building block. The building block may have more degrees of freedom if a new hard, newer hardware gives me 10x more rules. Fine, I mean, <coughs> I can use that and do a better job. But, but the point is well taken. It's like, I mean, uh, I, I'm not saying there's only 2,000 rules in, in the hardware. There could be 20,000, there could be 200,000. But we are agnostic to uh, that particular sort of the, that number. Yes? Can we summarize all the middle box actions as a sort of a computing action and subsequently there's a forwarding action and there's some kind of computing action and uh -huh. these middle boxes can potentially you know, be used for those and, and tag, your tag is I basically tells that some entity or the switch mm -hmm. what kind of computing action it should take, right? Is that the concept? Uh, in words, if not, you not, not in this part. Are you still talking about the previous part? Well, okay, I'm, I'm talking in general. I uh -huh. mean, the forwarding, you know, you're, you're looking at the flow ID and you're taking an action, forwarding sure. action. Mm -hmm. But you could potentially look at the forwarding ID and also look at some policy action. Uh -huh. And that policy could be any of those middle boxes. Right? Sure, so you're saying the rules could be coarser than per flow. In fact, we're actually doing like wildcard rules. We're not doing per flow, micro flow rules. We are doing wildcard rules, but you're saying that the number of rules may actually be number of policy classes, may not necessarily be number of uh, actual physical right. flows. Certainly, yes. that's something we can do. Now, all of these are sort of cool optimizations we could do on top of uh, what we're doing here. So here's sort of the third, even more, even harder challenge, right? The harder challenge is that uh, these middle boxes may do hidden things, like for example, a NAT may rewrite headers, a load balancer may rewrite headers, or a proxy may break connections and set up new connections to oh, external hosts. Now, in this case, if, 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 if there are these dynamic uh, actions that are hidden from the SDN controller, how do you actually set up the rules such that your policy chain is implemented correctly? So imagine in this case, you have two users and you want to do uh, different service chaining policies for these two users. So user one needs to go through proxy and then firewall. User two has to go through just proxy and then it's, he's, he's allowed to go to the internet. So it's like, okay, faculty or don't go through a firewall. <coughs> now what happens is like the proxy is actually going to break the connection and going to spawn new connections to the, to the internet. So at this point, when you're doing an internet S2, you actually don't know which is the green flow, which is the blue flow. What you see is like red and orange. Right? You see completely new flows, and you've lost the context for what this flow originally was. So actually, this is a much more fundamental problem. Here I'm talking about in the context of just service chaining, but it turns out uh, it's a much more fundamental problem where these hidden actions or middle boxes can cause a lot of problems for diagnosis. It can cause a problem for attribution and so on. So we will revisit this in the second half of the talk. But for, no for now, we can just think about even if you want to do service chaining, these dynamic actions can cause a lot of problems. So the way we address this problem is actually sort of this uh, idea that we borrowed from the security world. So in the security world, uh, there's this problem called the stepping stone detection problem, which is basically saying, imagine an attacker who uh, sort of attacks your machine and then uses it as a stepping stone to attack another machine. So instead of sending the attack flow directly, I sort of use an in-between hop and, and send the attack traffic through that. The solution in the in the stepping stone world was that to detect that if your machine was compromised and used a stepping stone, I could correlate <coughs> the flows coming into you and the flows coming out of you, correlate the flows, the packet payloads, or the timings to infer that you're actually being used as stepping stone. So you kind of use that insight and say, you know what, you can sort of treat this as like a stepping instance of a stepping stone detection problem. What we really want to do is imagine packets coming in out of the proxy and coming out of the proxy. And you want to correlate the payloads of these flows coming in and out of the proxy. And this is something you could do with the controller using some lightweight algorithms. And once the controller detects that, OK, oh, you know what, green was really red and blue became orange using this payload similarity algorithm, it can set up the right set of rules, set of now microflow rules, add the switch S2 uh, reactively uh, to make sure that the policy is not being violated. So again, this is somewhat of an expensive process because you have to collect the first few bytes of the, of the stream, send it to the controller, hold it there, 
uh, calculate the payload similarity and then install the rules. But if you want to do it in a perfectly sort of backwards compatible manner, uh, this is kind of a, a reasonable solution to the problem. Could an approximate solution? It's an approximate solution, absolutely. Uh, it's not always hundred percent accurate. Uh, and in fact, this is this is this is really the stumbling block that we hit. And we said, okay, we need a cleaner solution to inter integrate these dynamic actions, uh, which is the second half of the talk. Let's assume that you have a single as the end of main point. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I should have mentioned this. All, all of this is in the context of a single administrative domain. Uh, federated, I just throw up my hands and say, sorry, I cannot help, help you. All of this is a single administrative domain. Uh, that's a different rat hole I'm not going into. So are you further assuming that uh, the traffic is not encrypted? Sorry? Are you assuming here the traffic is not encrypted? Yes, Good question. Yeah, so here, we, can only, we have to implicitly assume the packet is not encrypted. Uh, so we can only do payload similarity if the package is not encrypted. <laughs> we say we throw up and say we cannot do it. So these are, these are fundamental limitations. You cannot yeah. handle encryption. You can do the timing, but it, you know, it's, it, it looks more like the security thing where it's becoming kind of inexact. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> exactly. So if you want to do, if you want like a clean solution, this is not a clean solution. But this is an okay solution for most many common cases. Yeah, it seems like the better solution would be just you know having vir pro like virtualizing the proxy and splitting it or something like that. But of course, if you're trying to be backward compatible. Uh, we have a different solution, but yeah, that's also a potential solution, but we can get to that. Okay, so sort of putting the pieces together, what we really had was these sort of three uh, building blocks that were high, sort of addressing sort of three fundamental problems when we, when, that we hit when integrating uh, middle boxes into this SDM framework. Uh, so one was the resource manager that handles how do you set up these rules uh, in a near, such that the, the load balancing is near mm -hmm. optimal without violating <coughs> such constraints. We have this sort of rule generator which sort of carefully sets up the forwarding table rules on, on the different switches such that you avoid these loops when you have this policy composition logic. And finally, we have this sort of reactive module uh, that informs the rule generator and says, okay, oh, I'm actually going to get this package, compute the payload similarity, uh, and then set up the rules. Okay, so I'm actually, I won't have too much time to go into the results, uh, but the sh sort of short takeaway is that We've actually shown, we've implemented this using Parks and Open <coughs> Switch and actually OpenFlow, the older versions of OpenFlow. And uh, what we've shown here is one of the benefits of doing this sort of more fine-grained load balancing using this simple system. So the y-axis here is the uh, sort of the maximum middle box load ma normalized with respect to optimal. So one is the best you can achieve, right? So you, you want to be as close to one as possible. And the two bars show the sim simple system. And the other option is what, uh, sort of what is the status quo is like if you can't do any of these correctly, you would do something like the fabric, do everything at the edge. The problem uh, is that you do like all the middle box processing at the edge before it goes into the core of the network. It turns out actually you can, it, it, the ingress based solution is not always optimal in load balancing because you could have a particular ingress that has a lot of load. So you might actually need like 7x more middle boxes in New York or San Francisco just because there's too much traffic over there. So it's, it's not sort of optimal from the load balancing perspective. Whereas simple achieves uh, close to optimal. Uh, I don't think that's a good argument. The beautiful thing about the edge is, is that your computational uh, capacity scales linearly with, with your with your computation. I mean, it's, it's it also like, means that you have to at least you have to have like seven x more resources to put there. No, but I mean the, the traffic is generated by CPUs, and those CPUs their you know computation scales linearly with. I, I think you're thinking with more of a data center centric view of the problem. I think your edge is really sort of the data center open vSwitch view. So I think I'm, this is more sort of, you think of an enterprise network, the edge, is, the edge is more like, oh, I have a site in Santa Clara, I have a site in San Francisco and in New York. So the, the, the view of what is the edge, in this case, the edge doesn't quite scale up. highly aggregated edge, rather than sort of a sharded edge. Okay. So this is really simple, right? So the simple system, uh, and there's many more results on like how the, the, the control is scalable, uh, the, 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 accurate, the accuracy of the, 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 the flow correlation is actually not too bad. You get like close to 90% accuracy for uh, realistic patterns and so on. So I won't have time to go into that. But sort of in a nutshell, what the simple system did was sort of push the envelope of where we can take SDN to integrate these boxes. So we came up with these three backwards compatible mechanisms uh, to do that. So in the next half, I'm actually going to do sort of zoom in on this one problem uh, which, which we saw when we did simple which is really uh, these dynamic actions on middle boxes, uh, where they may change the headers, they may change the payloads, they may break sessions, they may do all sorts of uh, crazy stuff. And actually, this is where we sort of took a step back and, and sort of looked at the original uh, SDN work, right? If you actually look at Ethane, Ethane sort of nicely sets up uh, 
what are the tenets that an SDN network should satisfy? And we came up with like three tenets. I'm just focusing on two of these tenets. So one tenet is this notion of origin binding. That at any point in the network, if you have a packet, you should be able to determine what is the origin of this packet. Like who is the host? Who is the, who is the particular physical machine that sent it? Or who is the user authenticated to send this packet and so on. So there has to be this fundamental notion of origin binding. Because if you want to do attribution or authentication or any sort of policy management, you need the ability to bind a packet to the origin. The second sort of fundamental tenet was that the path that you set up in an SDA network should follow the policy, right? I shouldn't have to like hard code all these crazy rules inside the network. The path should mandate the, sort of the, the, the paths follow the policy. In some sense, policy mandates what the path should be. And what we find in the context of these dynamic actions and middle boxes is actually they fundamentally violate these two tenets. If a NAT rewrites headers and that rewriting logic is proprietary to the NAT and not exposed to the world, you actually easily violate origin binding. Similarly, the proxy example with the great sessions, we, we don't have a policy mandated path because we don't know how to set up this path uh, because of the hidden actions of these boxes. So it's kind of interesting that we said, okay, let's go back, step back and say, what are, where are these problems stemming from? And really, this was where uh, the real problem was. Right? It's, these middle boxes are violating two SDN tenets. And as I mentioned, it's actually a very fundamental problem. Right? Uh, one problem is if you have a, a security system and you want to do some counting logic. Say, I want to count whether your machine has been detected if your machine has been compromised and it's sending a lot of outgoing connections. What I would do is do put like an NIDs an IDS and have it count the number of scans you're sending out. The problem, of course, is that if you have a NAT in front of it or a load balancer in front of it, it actually may hide the true packet source. So your counting logic is totally wrong at this point. And really looking at like the, the, the count of the NAT as opposed to count of the host who's what I'm trying to detect. The other problem is actually that uh, diagnosing what's happening inside the network becomes very hard. So there's been like really cool work in sort of network debugging uh, or out of Stanford. But you can think about a problem, this, this problem in a network with middle boxes. Even if you had every possible log, every possible packet trace, uh, even with a system like network debug, you could actually not solve this problem. Uh, because it's difficult to correlate the packets or the, or the uh, I forget what, what uh, NDB called it. There's a nice word of uh, the reports that the packet history. Uh, this postcard. Postcard, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. So this notion of a postcard that the packet sends to the controller. It's actually difficult to control, sort of correlate what these postcards might be. Because the header you see at S1 is very different from the header you may see at S2. And it's different from the header that the server actually sees. So imagine you have a, a sort of this load balance network. And a particular user is seeing a very high load, a sorry, very high uh, page load time. And you want to diagnose what a part went wrong. Maybe I need to scale up the firewall. Maybe I need to scale up the load balancer. Or maybe need to, I need to scale up the servers. Uh, in this case, it's actually difficult to correlate these network logs. Because the headers look very different at every every half in this part. So I'm not sure NDB is the good comparison. No, I was, yeah, sorry, I was using NDB um, as an analogy. But I mean, I, yeah. I, if, if I'm architecting a middle box, I would think along the lines of uh, Google Stepper, which is uh, sort of like an implementation of XFIX, right? It uh -huh. tells you precisely for a flow how much time was spent in the sure. network, at the middle box, and so sure. right? Even x rays are things like x rays would not work here because you need to correlate from the host to the network. You would need some way to like tracking the provenance of the flow through the network. So I was just using NDBs like okay as a sort of a analogy uh, here. Uh, you're right that N this is not a problem NDB is seeking, seeking to solve. So I'm not trying to say uh, this is this is a limitation of NDB. It's not a problem it's trying to solve. Right. So so this, this again even if you want to do network diagnosis, these middle boxes make things very hard. And this is something I think like even the I think the, the service chaining the group and IETF has sort of recognized some of these problems. It's difficult to get the chains right. It's difficult to do a diagnosis when you have these chains and so on. And finally, there's actually a very subtle uh, example where these dynamic actions may actually violate your, your policy. And you may not even know that you're violating the policy. So imagine you have like two users. And we want to block user 2 from accessing some website xyz.com. And the way you do it is you have a proxy for accelerating performance, and then you bought a separate uh, web access control filter to block people from accessing some particular site. Now, what could happen in this case is that host one, the user one, sends a request and a response. The proxy may cache the response, right? Okay, it's all xyz.com. It says, let me put it in my content cache. And when the next request from H2, user two comes in, 
it will actually get the cache response back from the proxy. And this is something that is completely sort of uh, opaque to us in the network because we don't know what the proxy is actually doing. So what we see here is that sort of this lack of visibility into the middle box context could actually cause uh, violations of the policy itself. All right, I mean, you can actually come up with a lot, I mean, a lot of such examples where the hidden and dynamic actions cause uh, problems for, for network management. And of course, at this point, there are many, many possible solutions you could think of. Uh, so you could say, oh, why don't I place the middle boxes in the right place? Why can't I do tunneling such that the middle boxes sort of directly do this composition? Why can't I do consolidation where I say uh, all, the, all the middle box functions runs in one box? So in this case, you don't have those routing problems. Or you can do the correlation like what Simple did. So each of these are somewhat sort of, I think of them as sort of these patches. They're like band-aids to a particular symptom, but they're not really solving the root cause. Imagine the root cause, remember the root cause really is that these middle boxes are violating the SDN tenant. They're violating origin binding, and they're violating uh, the paths follow policy tenant. And what we really need to do is sort of address that root cause as opposed to come up with these sort of band-aids in particular scenarios. Well, I would argue that that the you know the policy violation problem you know you're trying to solve a problem that exists in the hardware network with the middle boxes already, which is kind of surprising to me because you're not just you're not really just re-implementing what we already have. You're actually trying to solve a problem. Absolutely, with the that's, that's, that's it. It's a much more fundamental problem even if like today's networks. Yeah, you, I mean if you, you just wire them together, together, you still absolutely. have the same problem. Absolutely, right? yeah. even if the so, physic, even if you physically wired the network, you have this problem, right? Yeah. So I'm saying it's a much more fundamental problem that we sort of stumbled on. And it's, I mean, and tunneling just recreates that same physical wiring, and so it's not going to solve Tunneling doesn't solve Tunneling solve some of the problem. problem existed before you sort of arrived. You know, tunneling actually makes some of these things very hard. As somebody pointed out, tunneling actually makes diagnosis even harder. If you start putting these tunnels, you don't know, OK, how do I correlate what happened? Because you have, you have many more black boxes inside the network at this point. But tunneling does solve the routing problem, because it virtualizes the switches and makes sure that the paths are the paths that you specify. Sure, but it doesn't solve, for example, this dynamic proxy problem or any other. Right, right, right. Which is it solves some of this. Which is kind of orthogonal. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the high level idea we came up with, and it's sort of in hindsight, it's obvious. Like saying, okay, these boxes are fundamentally causing this problem. So why not you ask the boxes to tell you what they did, right? So why not we just have the middle boxes help restore these tenants in some way? <laughs> and in, in some sense, for example, in the proxy context and so on, this is the only option you have. Right? You cannot do correlation, you cannot have any other option, this is the only option you have. And really what we want these middle boxes to do is expose this missing contextual information. So you have this sort of causal context of what the prop, prop, prop packet went to, and really we want to expose that as what we call flow tags. Like each flow is sort of contextually tagged uh, with its processing context or the, or the provenance, and we need that to be exposed by the middle boxes. So for example, the NAT may tell you, oh here's the public to private IP mapping, or the proxy might tell you, okay, this packet, you know what, it, it was a result of a cache hit, or this other packet was a hit result of a cache miss, and now it's up to you to do what you want to do. But I'm exposing the processing context to you, you can do what you want to do. And you can imagine that now you have this SDN controller, sort of an enhanced SDN controller, that in addition to controlling the forwarding actions, is also going to control this tagging logic. It says, okay, oh, I need these middle boxes to expose this logic to me, so I also need the mechanism to control this tagging logic. And this tagging logic can be used by both switches and middle boxes. So let's actually see sort of a more concrete example of how flow tags would be used. Uh, similarly, going back to the example where you say, I want to block a subset of users from accessing the sort of internet, and I want to let others go through. So the nice thing now with, the, with our tag-based you know, uh, tag solution is that uh, the administrator can actually write the policy in terms of the original principles that he had in mind. <coughs> Right, rather than have to reconstruct and reverse engineer what the NAT would have done, I can just say, okay, I really want to block 192.168.1.1 and 1.3, and that's, that's my mental model of writing the policy. So what the controller would do is set up these tag-based rules uh, at the middle boxes and uh, these switches. <coughs> so the first thing is actually we need to generate the tags. So in this case, the NAT maps packets from 1.1 to tag 1, 1.2 to tag 2, and so on. So the NAT is going to write these tags to the packet. The switch is going to be a consumer of these tags. It says, okay, if I see tag one, I need to forward. If I see tag two, I need to just send it to the internet. And this action can be sent by the controller. And finally, we actually see that the other middle box is actually a consumer as well. It needs to decode the tag back to the origin 
that send this packet. So in some sense, what we see here is that switches are sort of passive consumers of this tag, and middle boxes are both generators and consumers of this tag. So of course, what we need is we do need modifications to middle boxes to support tag generation and tag consumption. Switches can just use existing open flow as long as this tag is encoded in some header field that's open flow compatible. So this is kind of the architecture uh, we envision going forward, right? If you want to do a clean integration of uh, the, the middle boxes with these uh, hidden actions inside SDN, what we envision is this sort of uh, this architecture where you have a new API between uh, flow tags enhanced middle boxes to control this tagging logic, uh, between that and the controller of the network operating system. And again, the reason we sort of do decouple the middle boxes and the switches is that these are two very different classes of vendors. We don't want to sort of decouple their innovation paths. We want the middle box innovation to be independent of the switch innovation. So switches continue to use uh, existing flow table, existing uh, open flow mechanism, as long as they can match on the tag bits that they're using. So we have these new flow tags APIs between the controller and the middle box, new policy mechanisms, new steering logic, new verification mechanisms that use the tagging logic. And of course, we do need modifications to middle boxes that need to produce and consume these tags. Is there any way to just infer the uh, inbound and outbound uh, middle boxes without actually having to have them like, provide new configuration? So like, if you know that this firewall, just from the base, based on previous packets, that it was blocking these two, then you can kind of infer that that would be forwarded and it wasn't used. So that's kind of getting back to the correlation uh, yeah. idea I was talking about earlier. You could do a lot of these things. The problem is, you, somehow it's unsatisfying. It's like, fundamentally, it doesn't solve the problem. You don't know if they got 100% accuracy right. or not. So if you really want 100% accuracy, if you want a clean solution, I think you would need the middle box to expose this information. You could come up with fancier machine learning algorithms to do this correlation. But I think it doesn't fundamentally solve the problem of these uh, SDN violations. Yes? Well, how's the tagging mechanism different from, let's say, you do virtual network? Your tag one is virtual network one, your tag two is virtual network two, and the problem sure. is also off. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, the concept of tagging is not new, right? The concept of tag is just a plumbing mechanism. A tag or a label switch is a, is a plumbing mechanism. The, the, the thing is, what are the semantics that the tag is trying to capture? In your case, the tag is trying to capture the virtual network. In here, the tags need to come from the middle box that say, okay, oh, this was the, oh, this was the source one, or this is the proxy <coughs> cache has to hit or miss. It's the semantics that, I mean, Having a tag in a network is not new, right? I mean, nobody will say that's new. But the problem is what the semantic of the tag is capturing is very different depending on what the application is. So the difficulty versus doing virtual network? Isn't we can say this offline, but I think the, the question is, I mean, you can, the idea of tagging itself is not new, right? I mean, it's been in networking as well as networking. Uh, but the concept is what the semantics the tags are capturing uh, is kind of subtle. Okay, so there are actually a lot of practical challenges in realizing uh, this architecture. Uh, that I won't unfortunately have time to, but I can sort of point you to the, the paper. So one question is what semantics should these tags capture, first of all, right? I sort of told you at a high level, but how do you systematically uh, generate these tags? Second is okay, how do we build a practical flow tags enhanced controller? And finally, this is actually a more practical question, is it possible for a middle box vendor to support flow tags, right? How easy is it to modify an existing middle box? Suppose you have the source code, how easy is it to add flow tag support to an existing middle box? And this is really key for adoption. We say, well, if it says that we need to completely re-architect how they wrote the middle box to support flow tags, I think that might be a non-starter. Uh, but we actually unfortunately show that it's not that that, that, not that difficult. So the semantics, this looks like a complex figure. But really what it is doing is the semantics that we need to capture uh, the tags is really we need to understand the all possible dynamic data paths a packet may go through. So imagine going back to the proxy ACL example. We need to have tags that say what is the origin and what is the current processing context or the processing state of the particular packet or flow. And really the transitions from these different nodes in the network capture the origin and the processing context. So and that's really the semantics your flow tags must capture. So in this case, the transition on the edge from proxy to ACL says that if it's host one, either it's hit or miss, you need to send it to the ACL. And this is really the semantics the flow tags needs to capture. So again, there's one Another practical question is that, can we actually have enough tags? I think somebody asked, can you encode these tags in practice? Uh, it turns out we can reuse tags across flows, we can reuse tags spatially, and we can do it within like 16 bits. Uh, we, have to we have to repurpose something in the header, uh, be it the VLAN field, or the IP ID field, or the uh, IPv6 low label field, but it's possible. It's not like too high, it's like 16 bits. Okay, so this is sort of the semantics. And again, uh, this goes back to the originals 
if you think about it in the context of service chaining, we need a richer abstraction for what service chaining means. You need to actually capture these dynamic transitions within the service chain for NFE or service chaining to actually make sense to avoid the policy violations we're talking about. So the policy, you can't just have a static uh, policy chain that says do web, fire, uh, web goes to firewall IDS and proxy. You actually need to have this annotated with the possible dynamic data paths that particular traffic could take. So it's a, it's a richer policy abstraction that you may need uh, in the context of service chain. Could you explain why that actually solves the problem of, of the proxy serving the content to H2 that it didn't, uh, that it wasn't supposed to get? Because that's really kind of not obvious. It looks to me like the proxy should, you know, consult the ACL before it uh, returns the data to H2. So what's doing is like actually we're saying that we want to route traffic from the proxy to ACL, irrespective of what whether it was a hit or a miss. Oh, okay. Oh, it's H1. You want to receive? Yeah. Got yeah. It, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. The original picture was H2. Or H2. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, you okay. swatched okay. switch. Okay. That's sorry. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Or maybe I missed it. I don't know. No, no. So, so what the flow tags enhanced controller needs to do is actually it's a reactive controller and that's something we're trying to fix. What we know how to do is a, a completely reactive system. So first it has to translate this dynamic policy graph into an actual data plane realization. And here we can use something like what we did in simple to translate this policy into an actual physical uh, data plane instead of flow routes. In addition, it has to support like new event handlers. Like similar to like say you have a packet in or a flow mod handler that you have an open flow, you would need like a tag, tag consumer, a tag generate uh, handlers uh, in uh, the controller. And it also has to say, okay, how do I do this expiry handlers? If a flow expires, I can repurpose this tag for other things. So it also need like corresponding flow expiry handlers. So again, so yeah, we sort of built this as an extension to parks or custom extensions to support uh, the tagging logic. And finally, sort of here's the, I think, the, the, the reason why we think this is hopeful. Uh, we, meaning uh, the student side, did a lot of hard work in trying to say how do you optim how do you sort of modify these middle boxes to add the flow tag support. And it turns out the number of lines of code we need is actually pretty small, right? And this is us as like complete non-experts in the middle box space, right? We said, okay, we knew a little bit about how these work, but we don't know much. So it took us like a month or so to figure out where to add these lines, but the actual lines of code is not that much. And if you compare it to the, the sort of the source code of the actual middle boxes, the flow tag support is pretty minimal. And imagine if you have like the guy who wrote squid or the guy who wrote snot needs to do it, it can be very quick for them. Right? It took us a month with players as non-experts with very little background to do it. So we had to use like control flow graphs and so on to do this. But if you're if you're the snot, if you're like Martin Rosh who wrote snot, this must be this must be a piece of cake for you. So the nice thing is actually requires minimal code modification. And this gives us hope that maybe uh, this can be adopted pretty soon. And you've also shown that, uh, again, this, because it's a reactive controller, we have a natural question on like how scalable uh, is this controller? Uh, and what we've shown is that uh, with a few optimizations, we actually take like very little time uh, to compute the flow rules on each packet or each flow arrival. Again, similar to open flow, we're not doing per packet, we're actually doing like a per flow or a per session. So that's, that's kind of nice uh, in the flow tag setup. And the overhead of doing that is pretty small uh, relative to the overall uh, flow set of time. Okay, so uh, I think before I conclude, I just want to sort of talk about sort of a broader uh, research agenda that we've been working on. This is like particularly looking at how can we extend SDN and how can we integrate TZ with SDN fold. But really, if you step back and look at what are the kind of pain points uh, people have with these middle box deployments, it's not just management complexity. Uh, which has really been the focus of this talk. How do you integrate, how do you use SDN to simplify the management? But there's also other pop problems, like, okay, these are expensive, right? And this is kind of the problems the NFP world is trying to solve, is that these boxes are expensive, they require a high capital in the infrastructure, and they're difficult to extend, right? Imagine you're an enterprise and you only want to support uh, people bringing their own mobile phones. The only way you need to, you know, as an operator to support these, is to go buy another iPhone gateway box. So in some sense, uh, Anytime your policy changes, the reaction of the operators is to go buy more of these boxes and, and sort of increases the, the sprawl and increases the complexity of the network. So wouldn't it be nice if you could sort of so, somehow have these boxes be more flexible? Let's say, oh, if you have like a virtual system, you can, can, in, in, can invoke a function on, uh, on demand. So to sort of address these other concerns, we've actually done other work. So for example, uh, we have talked about a world, and this comes back to some of these things we're talking about. Can you just think of it as instead of a hardware box as a software box? We said if you can decouple the software and hardware, you can think about a general purpose platform, a consolidated platform where you can run different kinds of these software modules. 
and we've shown that uh, there's a lot of benefits to doing that, both from the management side as well as sort of the capital uh, expenditure side. And even going further, if you think about these boxes as being just regular compute, you can actually say, well, in fact, I can outsource a lot of these functions to the cloud, the same way NFE is thinking about it, is that if it's just a compute engine, and a lot of people are doing this, you can, you can buy a virtual appliance that does IDS or a firewall today, can I just offload this whole function to the cloud and reroute the traffic such that it comes back to me uh, through the cloud IDS? And now this solves the flexibility problem and the overload problem because I can now get the benefits that cloud gives. I can do elasticity, I can do dynamic policies, and I can dynamically invoke new functions and just pay for what I can do. But, I mean, the reason why people have middle boxes and don't run them in EC2 is they don't want to pay for the, the expense and the latency. It's a great question. Actually, we've shown in the, in the paper that if you are at something like an uh, Amazon style footprint, the latency is actually not that high. In fact, you get this benefit of like, uh, like what overlay routing does. It's like sending it to like a well-connected node and back is actually better than your native BGP <coughs> node. We actually show that the latency is actually, latency impact is not that bad. I, I can point you to the paper. And the reason is that a lot of these cloud providers are much, much better provisioned, right? If you, instead of going through the native BGP path, you go one hop, it's like one hop, one hop overlay through a well-connected node actually gives you pretty good latency. I, I find it surprising to, to think that an IDS running in, you know, Oregon is, you know, to, to secure our Stanford Wi-Fi is going to be better than one, one running in Packard, but I guess you're right. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, yeah, maybe. It's entirely possible. Right? I mean, internet routing is totally, does not have triangular for routing properties. Okay, sort of stepping back again, this, this is, as I said, we're just scratching the surface here. There's a lot of broader set of uh, interesting questions and research opportunities that arise here. So for example, if you think about SDN, what are the right, nice kind of like not bound policy interfaces you want to expose? There's like interesting questions like, okay, what are the right policy language or the policy graphs, for example, that we want to generate? You want to think about how do you automate these extensions to middle boxes? Say, we are doing flow tags, somebody else wants to do something else. How can we support tools for vendors to integrate new SDN capabilities to middle boxes? Other things like thinking about like sort of NDB and ATPG and HSA and so on, they're really cool tools and they've sort of, sort of changed the way we think about these problems. But the question is, if you start thinking about these dynamic actions and these stateful actions, uh, you start hitting bottlenecks with a lot of existing testing and verification tools. The question is, can you test a whole network with both middle boxes and switches? What does it take to do those things? And finally, as I said, like, okay, uh, the, the consolidation shows how do we do it, but a broader question is what's the right sort of hardware software platform to support more sophisticated data plane uh, capabilities? And there's many more. I mean, this is just really uh, scratching the surface here. So to summarize, sort of, just to conclude, uh, the real motivation for us came from looking at the industry surveys and so on, and also looking at work we had done is these middle boxes are both sort of a necessity as well as a challenge for SDN. It's a necessity, a challenge, and an opportunity in some sense, right? It's like saying it's, a, it's an opportunity for SDN to show sort of tangible value to the operators who have these advanced functions. At the same time, it's a challenge because it sort of it pushes the boundary of the abstraction that SDN currently offers. So the challenges come from these composition requirements for service chaining, uh, new resource management uh, abstractions, and these hidden and dynamic modifications that these middle boxes. And what we've done in our work, I think sort of we've taken these sort of baby steps towards the problem of integrating uh, middle boxes inside the SDN fold. So one was this backwards compatible traffic steering solution called Simple, and the other is like a, a more sort of cleaner architectural solution to integrate these boxes with dynamic and hidden modifications. And I said, okay, the way I think about it is actually this, this is all part of a broader uh, research agenda, which I like to call the middle box uh, manifesto. That you sort of ignored these middle boxes and sort of have treated them as second class citizens for a very long time, mm -hmm. but maybe it's a good time for us to rethink how these kinds of advanced data plane functions, uh, in, in the context of service chaining, in the context of NFV, how do we rethink how these middle boxes are designed and managed from the ground up? I think it's sort of a good time for, uh, for us to sort of rethink a lot of those uh, issues. So again, uh, thanks again for having me uh, respond, and I'm happy to take uh, more questions. So it seems that the flow tags uh, lives on a domain-wide namespace, right? Have you seen any complexities of managing this namespace? What happens when you add new box, do you proactively assign some tags per middle box, uh, etc.? Uh, so right now, 
about multiple domains. No, no, single domain, but you have multiple boxes. You have a limited uh, space of flow tags. How, how do you assign? Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Uh, so we do have some mechanisms for encoding the tags. So the number of bits you need mm -hmm. is really a, a function of uh, the number of edges in the DPG and the number of possible policy classes. So if you think like you have like P policy classes and like say E possible dynamic transitions, it's sort of logged to the base two of the T plus. I mean, you can talk mm -hmm. about it offline. Really, mm -hmm. that's that's really the comp the the, the, the the expressivity you need from these tags. And as long as you have that many bits, you can you can be fine. And in fact, you can do a lot of like spatial and temporal reuse and bring it down even further. Okay. So it's kind of logarithmic in sort of the number of policy classes and the number of edges, dynamic transitions. Yep. Are you saying that you have structure to the tags so that we can have portion of the tag devoted to IDS um, portion de dedicated to proxy? It's a great question. We, do, we don't currently do that, but that would be certainly something that would be interesting. Uh, like if you can imagine these tags being a stack of tags or a hierarchy of tags. We don't currently do it. Right now, we, think we treat it treat as a flat namespace because we're trying to optimally encode it inside the 14 bits that we have. But you would certainly imagine that if you have a service chaining header and that header is longer, you could actually have a nice sort of hierarchy of tags or a stack of tags. We don't currently do that. But that's a, that's a great observation. As the network gets congested or uh -huh. some other sensors, triggers, you know, kicked in, kicks in basically, how do you influence these tags in real time? Uh, so actually, the flow tags work is actually a reactive controller. So as a flow goes through, we're actually, like similar to what Ethan or the original sort of open flow agenda was doing, we actually do a reactive controller. So it's it's pretty, as long as the controller can track the current state of the network, so your network information base is reasonably up to date, you can actually handle a lot of these uh, dynamic issues. What, what's the timing in terms of timing? Uh, so the timing, uh, the, the table we had like around like, each flow uh, setup takes like around like uh, 0.03 milliseconds, pretty small. Like the, the, the real bottleneck is actually pushing the rules to the switches and when the switches can update the rules. The, the, the computation of the controller is actually really, 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 really small. So it's a very, very tiny fraction of like, okay, it's the round trip of the controller that really kills you. And that, that's not something that, that's, that's, that's the problem with any of these centralized uh, solutions where you're doing the reactive controller. It's not unique to flow tags per se. But yeah, the over at EHAD is, EHAD is like 0 0.03 over what open flow does. Yeah. Have you considered Generating the tags at the endpoints and then modifying it as goes along. That's a great question. Right? I mean, that's a great thought. It's like saying, okay, instead of having these tags generated on the fly, you could actually have the provenance where the host tells you what it was. Yep. That certainly helps a little bit. I mean, you can certainly do that. Uh, but some of these tags have to come from the middle box. So if you think about, uh, there are two things. Right? One is like the path follow policy and the origin binding. The origin binding is like, who did this packet come from? There, you could have the source tag and say, okay, oh, I am IP address one and I'm going to put this in the tag. But if you have these dynamic transitions, like say, oh, the light IP has triggered an alarm and we need to send it to the heavy IPS, <coughs> or the proxy decided to cache this response and say, oh, it's a cache response. Those kind of tags have to necessarily come from the middle boxes. So it's certainly possible that for some of these some of these use cases, we could just have tagging at the endpoints and have the tag propagate too passively. But there are certainly examples where we need active tags from the middle boxes themselves. Well, so that maybe you could concatenate it on the way down because I think yes. what was generated so first meant a value all the way down. Yeah. I don't think that respect yeah. the stack of tags is, but yeah, you could certainly do that. Yeah. I, I think this, this point is interesting, which is that you know, going back to Ethane, it's, it's ultimate, all the policies really should be specified in terms of kind of user and application. And if the whole Certainly. network in the middle boxes had Certainly. access to that abstraction, they could implement the policy in a very simple, orthogonal way across the Certainly. whole Certainly, I think, yeah. There's a third tenet that I didn't talk about. Is that there's a tenet called high-level names in ETM. It's like, oh, policy should be expressed in terms of high-level names, not the MAC address and the IP address, because those are dynamic and those are, those are meaningless in some sense. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't go out to the high-level names, because that is a much more radical restructuring of the name middle boxes. Right? I mean, today, if you think about like a snort yeah. rule set, it's yeah. not written in terms of these high-level names. Yeah, Maybe they should be, but... Well, it's really interesting that it wasn't too hard to modify the middle boxes to deal with your tags. I'm like, well, maybe it wouldn't be too Maybe. hard to modify them to, to deal with the high-level names as long as they can access Certainly it's possible. I think like Squid, for example, does support yeah. some level of authentication and like uh, some, some abstraction of users and so on. Yeah, would be possible. We have time for one more question. Okay. I have a basic question, sorry. Uh, I have a testing background, so I just want to know what if a malform packet is injected with the wrong tag, like saying that like, this was already done post ideas or so the packet will again go back to proxy? No, no, great, 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 
Yeah, we are, we are treating the, the tag generation, either from the middle box of the switches, as coming from a trusted entity. Like the controller is controlling the action. Nothing is trusted. No, nothing is trusted. I mean, <laughs> of course, of course, nothing. No, no, certainly. Yeah, we are assuming the tags can be trusted. But you could imagine there is like something else, like, okay, some attestation that the, the box came, the tag came from the box, as opposed to the endo saying, oh, I'm, I'm a trusted packet, I went through post IDS and so on. That's a great, we, we, don't, we don't currently deal with it, but that would be something interesting to do. So we have the, the grander vision, I think of like some sort of an authenticated packet, right? The packet tells you, I, I, I've been attested by these boxes saying I'm okay. But right now, we are implicitly trusting that the tags only come from the boxes. So one option is you can say the ingress gateway can actually zero the tag and say, okay, the, the host cannot tell me anything. I don't believe anything the host says. I only trust anything that the network says. Again, the network itself could be corrupted, but let's assume the routers cannot be corrupted and so on, but yeah. But you can at least say, you can sort of close the attack surface and by uh, zeroing out the tags at the ingresses. But that's certainly something to look at. Okay, thanks a lot again.